opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Now I've been racking my brain and I cannot remember the last time I saw three great performances in boxing in three different matches the same weekend. Well you had three great performances. The last one I mentioned is going to be a little controversial but I believe you had three great performances this weekend that we need to talk about. Right? The best because he had a live active opponent was Errol Spence's victory over Danny Garcia. Now let me just say I had money on Danny Garcia. Right? In an earlier video I said you know I see three possible upsets on the horizon this boxing season. Joe Joyce over Daniel Dubois that delivered right I believe the Joe Joyce side got greater than three to one odds depending on when you place your bet. This fight I thought Danny Garcia was gonna cause flashbacks of an automobile accident that Errol Spence had right Spence's first time in the ring after an auto crash and then the coup de gras a fight yet to happen Kubrat Pulev who's going off as a seven to one underdog in some books over Anthony Joshua right we'll see if I win one of the three or two of the three I can't win all three because of Errol Spence's masterpiece and that's what it was let me just say it is very rare extremely rare to see a fighter who is an excellent short-range hooker who can have the kind of fights that Errol Spence had against Kell Brook, against Chris Algieri. Right? A guy who's accustomed to just collapsing the pocket and destroying you. Who's really adept, up close. Spence is a guy who can lean on you and work you over. But Spence is also a guy who, on his back foot against Mikey Garcia, that's a masterpiece fight and Danny Garcia can show you why he's one of the very best pound for pound. Now going into this fight it was clear in my mind that Terence Crawford would beat Errol Spence. Now I'm not so sure. Right? Spence to me is a bit of an impossibility. I'm still stunned that the guy's able to make 147 pounds. Absolutely astonished. I'm also amazed that Spence went through years of his career without really emphasizing the back foot game you saw against Mikey Garcia, you saw against Danny Garcia. That's really exemplary. Now this fight's interesting because Danny Garcia has experience at 147. He's bigger physically than Mikey Garcia. And he came to win. He's trying to hunt down Errol Spence. But he's a mid-range hooker, right? As we've said about Danny Garcia for years. He's best when you're at mid-range, when a pocket is set up. And Danny can throw wicked hooks and a straight right hand. Now before this fight, just tracking the interviews of the superstar athletes, Keith Thurman, in an interview, said that Danny Garcia was the hardest puncher he had faced. Sean Porter, in an interview, said that when you're in the ring with Danny, He's much better than you thought he would be. That Danny's savvy. That Danny hits hard. That Danny is a difficult opponent. Now folks, those are the only two men Danny lost to before this fight. Right? And you thought, you know what? Here is an underrated guy. Guy who's been champ before. Here's an underrated guy. In against Errol Spence, who now we're learning 
himself wondered whether he'd be able to continue his career after the car crash. Well, what happened, and it's really a film that you need to put in an archive, you need to look at in judging other fights. It's that good. What Errol Spence does, the consummate inside fighter, is he fights outside, right? I've never seen Danny Garcia this frustrated by his inability to set up a pocket because Spence is outside and he moves. He moves just enough where Danny Garcia has to reset. And then Danny Garcia tries to come forward. As I said, Garcia is a live opponent. Right? He's one I thought was going to win this fight. Garcia tries to come forward. And Spence then starts hitting him with an excellent jab. It's a constant. Spence can throw the jab while he's on the move. It's a mobile jab. Right? Spence also is acutely aware of the angles. So, Spence is aware that Danny Garcia is coming forward. When you're looking at great fighters, it's the little things they do that separate them from very good fighters. Spence is great. So as Danny comes forward, Spence is backing up. Right now, if I told you that the guy who beat Cal Brook is not only a guy with a developed back foot, he's a guy with a masterful back foot. You'd be scratching your head. But Spence is backing up, and Spence intrinsically knows. It's just mapped in his head where the ropes are behind him. So Spence, as he backs up, makes sure Danny never pins him on the ropes. Right? Spence is circling Danny Garcia. Not only that, Spence is vertical. Right? He's not just hitting Danny Garcia with a jab. He can bend low and hit Danny Garcia with body shots. Right? The jab to the body, but also the other hand, the right hand to the body, because Spence is a southpaw. Right? I'm just telling you, when you see a southpaw who can box like this, who has the power Spence has, many opponents are going to be overwhelmed. Right? We've seen slick southpaws, Hall of Fame level slickness on a southpaw before. Think Pernell Whitaker. But understand, Spence has the power, the implicit threat, that he can then jump deep in the pocket. Not just in the pocket, but deep in the pocket. And rough you over, like he did Chris Algieri. Let's talk about some of the little things that I thought that Spence was doing phenomenally well. First, keep in mind, it's a mistake to think of Spence as just a slugger. I want you to focus on his defense in this fight. Spence has his hands up. Spence is too far away from Danny for Danny to hit him with the right hook. Then when Danny hits him with the right hook, Spence has it blocked the vast majority of the time. Now it's interesting because Spence is riddling Danny Garcia with a right jab because he's a southpaw. But understand, Spence is a master who knows how to think the jab and who has the sequencing down where he can hit you with the jab then as you try to counter him, right, as you try to counter him, Spence is able to cover up. Right, it's a really an interesting type thing. So, Danny's completely frustrated. He can't land the left jab. Excuse me, he, he can't land a left hook, nor can he land a right hook, because Spence also knows how to take a step back. 
It's all fluid. It's all working together. Spence also knows, and this is top level stuff, how to catch your punches on his jab hand's forearm. So Spence at times has his right hand out like this. Right? He'll land the jab, then he'll go like this as he backs away and he'll catch what's coming back on his forearm. Then he'll come back with his dominant left hand. Let me say that the performance is simply masterful. Garcia can't get in range. Garcia can't get in rhythm. And understand, Spence is alternating. In other words, he's on his back foot, he's moving away. But when the situation presents itself, Spence will come on his front foot. But he doesn't have to rush in on his front foot. Right? It's a nuanced performance. I'm here emphasizing his back foot. Spence does a lot on his front foot in this fight. There's even a moment in this fight where Spence decides to come inside and rough up Danny Garcia. And he does. And it seems to catch Danny by surprise to see Spence so close in the pocket. Now I've talked about how when I watch baseball, one of my favorite pitchers of all time was Greg Mannix. In other words, you looked at him, it wasn't that he was throwing 95 mile an hour fastballs or anything like that. It was just that the guy was the complete pitcher. Many pitches, absolutely spectacular defensively. He won several gold gloves to go along with the great pitching. You didn't know what he was going to throw on a 3-2 pitch. That's Errol Spence here. He's beating Danny Garcia methodically. And he's doing it without overexerting himself. Folks, it's, it's a downright shocking performance. Danny's eye starts to swell up. Spence is not in a rush. He's okay being on his way to a decision. Spence lands some big shots on Danny. Spence is not in a rush. He's such a good boxer that he doesn't have to leap in even when he has an opportunity. He knows, look, as long as I circle this guy, as long as I don't get pinned on the ropes, as long as I am defensive, as I said, he has his hands up, he leans forward, it's hard to find his body. I want you to look closely at Spence's body, he's very thin. As I said, I'm surprised a 30-year-old who's been at 147 for as long as he has is still able to make weight. But Spence is a master at hiding his body. Right? Danny, who I've seen rough up many guys, including greats. El Terrible, for example. Danny Garcia went in, roughed him up. Looks like he has short arms against Errol Spence. That's how dominant the performance is. He can't reach Errol Spence's body. In other words, Spence isn't there in the pocket for him to land hooks. But yet somehow Errol Spence is able to land jabs. Errol Spence is able to follow up great right jabs with straight left hands. Errol Spence is the only one landing punches at times. Then when Danny comes in, plans a counter or plans an assault, and is able to throw some punches that hit Spence, where are they hitting? Spence's forearms, Spence's gloves, right? Normally sluggers don't have this level of defensive awareness. Spence, the consummate deep in the pocket slugger, has complete defensive awareness as he's outside operating behind a jab. By the middle of this fight, Danny is frustrated. He can't get 
close enough to Spence to hurt him in a fight where it doesn't look like Spence is moving that much. He is. But you have to actually look at the film. In other words, Spence doesn't look like he's up on his toes dancing. This is a more nuanced performance. Again, it's like watching Greg Maddox. It takes a while to realize, wow, Spence is moving around the ring. Spence is on his back foot. Spence is hitting this guy with a constant jab. Spence is catching the other guy's punches. Spence's defensive guard is always up. Garcia can't hit Spence to the body. Right, Spence is actually landing. Left hands. While he's jabbing Danny to death. Then when Spence jumps in the pocket, Danny's overwhelmed because Danny's not a short-range fighter. So Danny has to back up. Then Spence backs up. Re-establishes the long-range distance where he's dominant over Danny. This is Spence's best work. If you enjoyed the Mikey Garcia fight, folks, this is that fight plus some. Spence is only 30. Right? Spence is a threat at 147. Spence is a threat at 154. Right? In my head, I feel that Virgil Ortiz is going to inherit the reins at 147 and 154. Let's just say this fight has me rethinking everything. Crawford Spence, Ortiz Spence, Let's just say Spence is a Hall of Famer in his prime. I hope people are aware of the work he's done. Right? Think about it. He's beaten Mikey Garcia, who's a definite Hall of Famer. He's beaten Sean Porter in a unification match. He's beaten Danny Garcia, and those are just his recent fights. And that's during a time period where Spence suffers a debilitating car crash and still pulls down one of the best performances of 2020. Let's talk about another match. And this match is also some of this fighter's best work. Billy Joe Saunders fought Martin Murray. Now understand, Martin Murray is a guy who likes to counter. He fought Sergio Martinez, an ambush fighter. And when Martinez jumped into the pocket, Martin Murray was ready. Right? Martin Murray is the kind of counterpuncher who isn't dazzled by speed. He's not dazzled by your suddenness. This is the crafty vet. He's not much of a knockout puncher. What he is is a boxer who, no, who figures out beforehand, okay, I can hit him with the right counter. Then when the guy jumps in, Murray's ready with it. Now, I'll agree, Murray's 38 years old. But my God, just like with Danny Garcia, I've never seen Murray get so beaten up ever. Saunders, who you think of as a mover, and he moves in this fight. He's a southpaw like Errol Spence. It's a shame they can't fight each other because you're talking about spectacular talent, right? Spence is dedicated to the sport, is always in shape. You wonder how Spence makes 147, simply because Spence looks like he has a big frame. Saunders is different. People question Saunders' dedication to the sport. People who run into Saunders between fights Notice that Saunders is out of shape. Saunders has some fights where he's putting on a spectacular show. Then he looks like he runs out of gas. The Chris Eubank fight, for example. Someone's going to have to explain to me how a fighter can look that good the first six rounds and then look that winded the last six rounds. Did he prepare for the fight or not? Well, I'll just say this. You know, maybe Saunders is a man about town. Maybe Saunders isn't the most committed to the sport. 
But my God, he's a savant. Folks, this is a masterful performance. I can't put it with the Errol Spence performance because Martin Murray does next to nothing. Martin Murray doesn't put up the fight that Danny Garcia tries to put up. Right? Danny comes to fight. He just gets outthought and outfought by Errol Spence. Martin Murray, by contrast, looks like he's in survival mode, and then you realize, wow, we're in the third round. How's this brother in survival mode already? Right? But what's noteworthy with the Saunders fight? And what I want people to see and figure out is that Saunders isn't an ambush fighter. In other words, he's not just jumping in. Think David Hay. He's not jumping in, throwing a bunch of punches. Alexander Povetkin, predetermined flurry. Right, is outside, sees the other guys sleeping a little bit, jumps in. This is what Sergio Martinez used to do. Right, throws some big punches, then gets back out. Your key scamboa, in my opinion, ambush fighter. Now, this is different. Saunders, who is fast handed, right, he could be out of shape. He, he's fast handed. Saunders, who's fast handed, comes in and he's actually boxing. He's not throwing some predetermined combination. He's actually doing things that lets you understand that he knows how to fight inside. At different times in this fight, he comes in, he literally sticks his head under Martin Murray's chin, reels off some body shots, is prepared to stay for dinner. Right? Then Murray kind of scampers away and covers up. Now I know most people disagree with me and I'll agree. I deserve a lot of criticism for constantly questioning Canelo against superstar opposition. Although I will say he fought Golovkin twice, I picked Golovkin twice, I feel I got job twice. I have yet to see Canelo beat Golovkin. But I will say this. Canelo obviously has done great against some fighters I thought he'd have a problem with. Sergi, um, Kovalev, for example. I just don't see how Canelo can beat Billy Joe Saunders. I just don't. Saunders moves a lot better than Canelo. Saunders, like Errol Spence, is long range. He's also short range. Right, this is a guy who knows how to fight. Martin Murray, folks, this fight is over early. You're there looking at the fight and you're thinking, wow, Murray needs a knockout to win the fight. Then you stop yourself and you say, man, am I being fair? Since it's only the fourth round or the fifth round, and theoretically, if Murray runs the table, he might be able to win on the scorecards. Right, this fight's a huge mismatch. Saunders looks spectacular. Now let me get controversial here because it seems to me like I'm in the twilight zone. I was watching a fight on BT Sport, a film of the fight, right? And somehow the announcers had this fight close. I thought, you got to be kidding me. Then I heard the scoring at one judge had it 117-111 for Anthony Yard. Now, I don't say this lightly. It's December of 2020. The judge that had it 117-111, to I'm entitled to my opinion, turned in the worst scorecard of calendar year 2020. What fight were they watching? What round before the 12th round did Anthony Yard do anything whatsoever? Now, this was my first time watching his opponent, Lyndon, King Arthur. Right, folks? <laughs> I'll just say this. I'm a child of the 1970s. I was raised on Larry Holmes as the heavyweight champion. 
right? As I like to say here online, Larry Holmes fights didn't start until an opponent figured out what to do with Larry Holmes's jab. If that opponent was getting hit in the face and had no way to get past the jab and stayed outside and continued to get riddled and slapped up, that opponent had no chance. None. Well, let me just tell you, Lyndon King Arthur has a Larry Holmes level jab. On a weekend of great jabs, I thought Spence's jab's great. I thought Saunders's jab is excellent, right? Great jabs. Lyndon Arthur's jab is just one cut above that, right? This is a battering ram. More importantly, Lyndon, like Larry Holmes, is tall. He knows how to use it. He sets it up like a guy who knows his jab is worth a million dollars. So he's fainting. He's not just throwing it. He's fainting. The jab's so effective, folks, he doesn't even have to have a hand up. I'm not, I'm not making this up. Look at the film. I have the fight in my favorites folder here online. Look at the film while you can. His jab's so good that after a couple of rounds, he can drop his hands. Literally drop them. And as the other guy thinks about coming in the pocket, all he has to do is faint like he's throwing the jab, and that freezes the opponent. That's how good the jab is. And when you're watching a great jabber, you're mystified by the opponent. You're thinking to yourself, wow, when's the opponent going to figure out how to get by this jab? Right? There's an optical illusion. You're watching a great jab and you're just thinking, my goodness. You know, certainly the opponent can just dip under it and run inside and stuff like that. And the answer is no, the opponent can't. King Arthur completely blows out. I mean, blows out Anthony Yard. At one point, Yard's corner's talking to him. And they're telling him, man, you know, his other hand looks hurt. He's not even, <laughs> he's not even throwing his other hand. All King Arthur's throwing is the jab. So his corner's telling him, hey, man, look, that other hand must be hurt. And I know in the post-fight comments, we're hearing, oh, one of Arthur's hands is hurt. I'm not sure if that's the case. Because the guy does throw that right hand on occasion. He does. I just believe when you are winning a fight with your jab and you don't have to open up, especially when the opponent is a heavy-handed guy like Anthony Yard, when you're keeping Yard outside, I mean, it's as if Arthur has a fence around him. When you're keeping Yard outside and you're throwing a jab, why would you open up with the right hand to give Yard an opportunity to counter? Folks, this fight does not start until the 12th round. Right? Lyndon Arthur has a Larry Holmes level jab. There are going to be some nights like this where he doesn't have to throw anything else. Let me say this too. Like Larry Holmes, when Anthony Yard does get inside, particularly in the 12th round, Lyndon Arthur knows exactly how to tie him up. Right? You know, in other words, these jab guys control you to the point where when you enter, they have a warning, right? The uh, jab is kind of like a fence. So when they see you hop the fence and you run inside, unless you're savvy, unless you're a guy bobbing and weaving, hiding his upper body, right? Mike Tyson, right? I was going to say young Mike Tyson, hell. Now I can say 50-something Mike Tyson. Right? But Mike Tyson, unless you're the kind of guy who can come in 
have your hands up so as the guy tries to hold you, you're throwing punches and making him pay. You make it such that if he's going to grab you, he has to deal with you know, body armor, where you're having hands up that don't allow him to clinch, right? Golovkin does this well. Anthony Yard's not on that level. So Anthony Yard slips the jab. In the 12th round, he almost gets the KO. He slips the jab. He's heavy-handed. But you'll notice Arthur just seamlessly ties him up most of the time. Now, I thought in a fight where one judge had it 117-111, I thought Arthur wins, I don't know, minimum nine rounds. Right? Anthony Yard, I, I know he thinks he was robbed. I'll concede here that the announcers on the BT Sports feed that I watched seem to think that Anthony Yard edged the fight. In the comment section of this video, I want to know your thoughts. I was watching a masterful performance. I mean, this was on par with Spence, with Billy Joe Saunders this weekend. I was looking at this Arthur guy, and I was thinking, how did I not know about this guy? The jab was that good. I mean, by the third or fourth round, you were just saying, my God, is, you know, when is this fight going to start? Is Anthony, <laughs> put it this way, by the third or fourth rounds, you were thinking, man, Anthony Yard's off to a terrible start. When is he going to get started? Will he be able to get past this jab? By the eighth round, folks, it's a done deal. Right? At that point, you're thinking, man, is Arthur going to get tired and understand how good the jab is? You notice early, he's not throwing the other hand. That's obvious early. Just like Larry Holmes. It's obvious he's not throwing the other hand. He's one-handed. And like a lion tamer, he's completely tamed Anthony Yard. It's astonishing. I thought Lyndon Arthur won the fight going away. I think his jab is one of the best punches in boxing. Forget the division. One of the best punches in boxing. I think he was facing a very limited fighter. Anthony Yard, the fact that he thought he won was comical. I don't, you know, you can't be that low volume. I didn't know what Anthony Yard was doing. At times, Yard does a lot of movement, then he throws his own punches. Let me tell you how dominating Arthur was in terms of the spacing. Anthony Yard's throwing punches. Arthur doesn't even move his head. The punches stop here. They're not landing. I didn't even know what Anthony Yard was doing. Right? One would have thought Anthony Yard would have come in Rocky Marciano. When he was fighting, some guys would hit you on the forearm and stuff like that. There are times in the Errol Spence fight where I was wondering, is Danny Garcia deliberately hitting Errol Spence on a forearm, trying to wear out his arm or whatever, right? Eddie Futch, Ken Norton in a fight, decided they were going to hit Ali on his bicep, right, to slow down his hand speed. Anthony Yard here doesn't have any strategy that I was able to figure out for at least the first nine rounds of the fight. I'm, I'm not kidding. At least the first nine rounds of the fight. I don't understand how any judge could have Anthony Yard winning the fight, much less doing so by six rounds. So, this is my first ever Worst Judging of the Year Award. I'm awarding it to the judge who had Yard winning the fight 117-111. I just, I just don't get it. 
Let me say this about Lyndon King Arthur. Right? There are going to be some fights where he's going to have to throw that right hand. Right? Also, I question a guy who's 6'2", 175. Right? To me, that's too tall and thin. Eventually, he's going to have to gain weight to get to the cruiserweight division. And there, I suspect, the attitude is going to be different. He's going to face some fighter who's going to be aggressive and say, okay, you're going to hit me with that jab. I'll take the risk that the jab doesn't knock me out. I'm going to try to walk through it. Or he's going to face an Antonio Tarver type guy, a slick southpaw, who's going to say, hey, I'm here and I know how to avoid a jab. I know how to move, you know, let's say I'm throwing the jab here. I know how to move over here to hit you at odd angles. Or he might run into the cruiserweight equivalent of Deontay Wilder, right? A guy who can stand outside who can say, hey, I also have ring coverage, right? That jab might keep me X feet away. Guess what? I can knock you out from this distance. But let's just say at 175, my goodness, fighters who can't move, who aren't agile, who aren't risk takers, are going to have problems with this guy. The jab's that good. That's how I see it. Let me hear from you. Kudos to Errol Spence, Billy Joe Saunders, and Lyndon Arthur. I thought all of the performances were A-level performances. Great performances. I know Arthur doesn't throw his right hand that much. I'm hearing it was hurt and stuff like that. Folks, if you've tamed the lion with your jab, you don't need to throw the right hand. If you're winning rounds, that's the point of boxing. That's how I see it. I look forward to your comments. Thanks for stopping by.